Okay, and I am delighted to welcome you to this event, the Russophone Literature of Resistance, a Zoom launch for the March-April 2023 issue of the magazine World Literature Today. This event is co-sponsored by the Romanov Center for Russian Studies, the magazine World Literature Today, Columbia University's Harriman Institute, and the Department of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. We are all also very grateful to Eileen Ha and the rest of the staff at the Harriman Institute for their help in hosting this event. Um, we are thrilled to have such a good crowd. Um, and I just wanted to start by making an announcement. Since this event is run in a webinar format, you can uh, submit questions. We're going to have a little time for questions and answers at the end through the Q&A functionality in the Zoom webinar. Or if you are watching us through YouTube, you can use chat um, the chat function on YouTube. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to my colleague, Daniel Simon, who is the Editor-in-Chief of World Literature Today, and who will talk a little bit about the spring issue of the magazine. Thank you so much, Emily, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'd really like to just quickly acknowledge that uh, Dr. Johnson has been a contributing editor and uh, editorial board member for WLT for, for more than two decades now. And in 2011, um, we collaborated on a post-Soviet lit issue together that uh, Kevin Platt contributed to, as did Polina Barskova and, and others um, at the time. But then about two years ago, um, Emily and I started discussing the idea of featuring Moscow or St. Petersburg as a WLT city issue. But then we tabled that idea when the Russian Federation launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022. Uh, so then last summer, we decided to devote the issue to Odessa and Kharkiv, guest edited by Ilya Kaminsky and Katie Ferris. And then we made it freely available throughout the first month of publication, which we are making again possible this month as, long, as well as with the Russia issue. And so I'll put more details about that in the chat a little later on. And then after the, the Ukraine issue came out, um, Emily reached out to Mark Lipovetsky about doing a Russia issue after all. And then he enlisted Kevin Platt's uh, assistance in conceptualizing it. And then uh, when Emily suggested that we devote the section to the literature of dissent, uh, they immediately agreed and, and set, out, set about putting uh, together the lineup of the issue that we are so happy to launch uh, today. I would just like to quickly thank the, um, the Romanov Center for Russian Studies here at the University of Oklahoma for their sponsorship which made possible the participation of Maria Stepanova, Mikhail Shishkin, and Ruthie Jerebekova. A special thanks to Dr. Johnson and to Dr. Melissa Stockdale, the co-directors for their enthusiasm and support for this endeavor. So I will turn over the MC duties to Mark Lipovetsky and Kevin Platt. Uh, Mark is a professor in the Department of Slavic Languages at Columbia University. Kevin is Professor of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, Thank and you, Daniel. Emily as well. Um, we should say that uh, I think Mark and I and all of the authors and translators and artists who worked on this issue are extraordinarily uh, grateful to World Literature Today for making these voices and images available to a broader uh, English language reading public. Um, I think it's an important thing to do right now. Um, so we'll start with just a few words about the conception of the issue that we're presenting. Um, as a result of the horrific and unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, there is a lot of resistance to uh, quote unquote Russian literature, music, art, everything right now in the world. Uh, and we can start by saying that this is justified in the case of some writers and cultural figures. Um, yet there's also an increasing urgency to understand this war, not in terms of nationalities in conflict, but in terms of empire. Uh, empire always complicates descriptions of nationality. There are Russian speakers on both sides of this conflict, inside and outside of Ukraine. 
and inside and outside of the Russian Federation. And there is an increasing urgency around the decolonization of Russian language writing, addressing the reality that there are many Russian language writers not identified with the Russian state and its war, many of whom work and have worked for a long time in resistance to that state, many of them because their ancestors were colonized uh, by the Russian and Soviet empires, just as the Ukrainians were. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, to continue with what Kevin uh, said, I, I first want to uh, express our gratitude to the editors uh, of World Literature Today and uh, Emily and Daniel personally, and, and to designers of this issue. The issue looks uh, very effectively, I would say, and uh, not only on its cover, but, but, but inside. Uh, and uh, for this event, I, I am truly uh, happy to see so many uh, friends, colleagues, and even um, contributors to this issue among uh, participants of this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, we, are, we are really excited to, to bring readers' attention to the extraordinary writings of Maria Stepanova, Mikhail Shishkin, uh, Ruth Eugenia Their works are featured in the special issue we are presenting today, alongside uh, works by other authors, including Igana Jabarova, Konstantin Shavlovsky, Alexander Skidan, Maria Marinovska, whom I see among the participants of this uh, webinar, uh, Ramil Niyazov, and uh, also uh, visual artwork and photography by Victoria Lamashka, Lenor Garalik, and Sergei Nikolaev. All of the writers we have gathered who present the greatest possible diversity in their backgrounds and places of origin, contribute to what we have termed the Russophone literature of resistance. And that's, that's the title of our special issue. Uh, the Putin state, state likes to think of itself as representing all of Russian culture and everything written and said in the Russian language anywhere. The voices we have gathered together respond to that claim with a resounding no. They have their own voice in Russian language, ones that are opposed to the Kremlin, to both its imperialism in political sphere and to its cultural imperialism. Um, I'd also like to add a shout out to, I think, Hila Cohen, one of our translators uh, for this issue, who's also present in the webinar, um, and also say hi to Maria as well. Um, let's introduce our speakers, um, starting with Maria Stepanova. Uh, Maria Stepanova is a prize-winning poet and the author of In Memory of Memory. Uh, it's a volume of creative nonfiction that has been recognized with many Russian and European awards and was shortlisted uh, for the Booker Prize. Uh, as founder and editor-in-chief of Kolta uh, Tochkaru, one of the most in influential cultural port uh, portals in Russia, uh, Stepanova voiced consistent and outspoken opposition to the Putin regime for years. She was also among the first Russian authors to protest the 2022 Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine with her essay, The War of Putin's Imagination in the Financial Times. Mark, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. Uh, Mikhail Shishkin, uh, I have an honor to introduce him, is a famous, prominent author of fiction and essays. His work has been recognized with multiple awards, uh, including the Russian Booker Prize, the National Bestseller Prize, the Big Book Prize, and most recently, the Italian Straga Prize. He is a long-standing and outspoken critic of the Putin regime, whose essays have been published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, Le Monde, and elsewhere. Uh, since 1995, he has lived and worked in Switzerland. And... Ruthie Jenerbekova uh, was born in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and graduated from the Kazakh State University as an ecologist. Since 1997, she's been involved in various literary, artistic, and curatorial activities, and also works as a cultural organizer. Uh, she was one of the founders, uh, along with Maria Vilkavitsky, 
of the imaginary art institution, the Criolex Center. Her fields of interest include performance philosophy, material semiotics, and art-based methodologies. And she's currently a PhD candidate at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, um, living and working in both Almaty and Vienna. So. All right, so so let's 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 have some some conversation and uh, let me ask uh, the first question addressed to, to 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 all speakers and please feel free to answer in any order and if you want to interfere so just just let us know right uh, so so the question is very simple and very obvious and directly um, stemming from the focus on the Russophone literature of resistance and and I'm sure you. You answered this question many times, so so, but maybe not all in our audience uh, have heard your answers to it. So, how, if at all, has your writing changed since the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine? What does it mean now to write in Russian for you, personally? Who would mm -hmm. like to begin? Blink if you want to start speaking. Or just start speaking. Or just start speaking. Misha, would you please? <laughs> Should I begin? I yes. thought ladies ladies first. Because because your mic is unmuted, so so it will take less time for you. <laughs> first of all, I'm happy to be part of this issue. It's very important that this issue is devoted to Russian culture, Russian literature, and we all see and realize now the Russian culture is under fire all around the world. <clears throat> the whole, my whole life, my whole life, I felt firm ground under my feet, Russian culture. This last year, it's just blown away, blown away. I realized what Kazimir Malevich meant with his black square. It was his feeling for the future, for the coming horrible future. And what was in his future? It was First World War, bloody, horrible civil war, and Gulag. Now is Russia. Just this black square. And if people try to make some art literature in Russia, it's impossible. They have to sing patriotic songs or to keep silent. And now the whole Russian culture is just an emigration, is abroad. And we have a mission. We have a mission to show the whole world that there is Russian culture, that there is humanistic Russian future, yeah? that we are against the war, but how should we do this? I think we just have to be ourselves, just to stay what we are. We are Russian writers and we prove that we are making Russian culture, we are Russian culture. Like Thomas Mann, when he left Germany and went to the United States, and he was asked, yeah, where is now German culture? He answered, I am German culture. So now we have this responsibility to be Russian culture. Thank you, Mish. Thank you so much. Who would like to, to continue, agree or disagree? So, so what's, what's your take? Ruthie, Masha. Um, maybe, maybe I could just shortly um, uh, say that uh, 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 two two things. First of all, um, I'm really honored to be here and feel a bit uh, out of place, uh, or maybe yeah. I don't know how to say that. Uh, I'm. I mean, my achievements in Russian. Russophonic, Russophone pop literature are not that um, that big, uh, but still I'm here, and I have to say that not all of us 
represent Russian culture here. And it's been an issue for us in Kaz uh, for, uh, for, for Russian, Russian speaking people in Kazakhstan, especially writers, uh, for ma many, many years, because uh, each time this topic of uh, belonging to Russian uh, culture or non belonging to Russian culture arises uh, since long time ago already. And uh, each time we have to say that. Um, uh, not all of the Russian, Russian speaking people belong to Russian culture. And uh, I, I think that for us now it's uh, mm, on the background of this horrible war. There are two uh, different kind of issues um, uh, uh, that two questions that are important. First of all, of course, we have to show and acknowledge that uh, there is a Russian culture of resistance, that there is another Russian culture, that exactly what, what uh, Mikhail just said. And, but also uh, there is an opportunity for us non-Russian people, people who are not Russians, to, to, to say something about ourselves as, um, yeah, and our own culture, like Kazakhstani culture, which is partly a Russian speaking culture. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, we also, of course, uh, somehow join this uh, cultural resistance uh, to Russian aggression now. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Masha is answering my question in the uh, big interview she gave to Kevin and me. And uh, so, so uh, it, it, it's slightly redundant to ask this. Mark, you are muted. I don't know how I do this. Uh, something happening with me, and I'm muting myself. So, 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 and the uh, title of uh, uh, the interview with uh, Maria Stepanova is: "You may want to write about butterflies, but ultimately, you will have to explain the war." And in a way, in a way, it it answers my question. But I'm sure that Masha has something to add to it, right? I'll try to. Maybe not to add, uh, but well, to uh, obviously it is such a huge question. You are unable to answer it uh, in one liners or in bunch lines. Uh, and uh, well, uh, of course, I'll start with uh, trying to express my gratitude to all the enormous work you've done with this issue. It is a huge honor to be. Uh, included into this list of wonderful writers that are trying to oppose the, the Russian state machine in different ways, in different voices. And uh, an honor and, uh, well, as well as a challenge. And uh, the challenge is quite serious. I am very grateful to Ruthie for her words because for me, in a way, it is a starting point of a big conversation that is dealing with the very definition of what Russia and Russian culture or Russophone culture, or you can give a number of different well, definitions or taglines, but we, we, well, we have to start the, converse, so the conversation first because it is not exactly clear how to define this territory of pain and struggle and belonging that is somehow described by, well, in the Russian language or by referring to Russian language as the main representative of Russian culture that is not exactly defined as well. There is a number of cultures, a number of voices, obviously a number of languages that are actors on this enormous scene, but the actors who get under noticed, under appreciated. So maybe while well, starting, maybe in a way, instead of writing, we should come back to the starting point. We should try to describe what what this well Russianness of being Russian or non-Russian, what does what does it mean? What are the power lines uh, behind the uh, behind the scene? Uh, to go back to to the very beginning, 
and that might help us uh, with, with a better understanding of the catastrophe that had happened and uh, maybe with, uh, with the writing as well, because I have this clear feeling that the language itself should be changed in some way, but how and who is to be the agency for the change? That, that, that's the open question, and I'd like someone for someone to answer it. Thank it's you. a tough question. I mean, it's, I think that the, all of these three different responses points to the, 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 the situation of multiplicity that we face with regard to thinking about uh, what is uh, the Russophone or the Russian literature of resistance, this object that uh, Mark and I posited in the introductory essay to this issue. Um, in some sense, you know, Russ Russophone, like Francophone or Anglophone, is a very convenient term to use. It, it distinguishes a whole number of people who write in and use a language from the national identity, which is commonly associated with the other term, Russian. Um, and in that sense, it's a very convenient term, Russophone. Um, at the same time, one doesn't really want to give all of Russian away. Um, as we all know, you know, we're all grown-ups in the world. Um, Russia uh, is imperial inside as well as outside. Um, so do we have to move our border further inside and, and think about all of the people of, I guess, non-Russian heritage? Who write in Russian and speak in Russian and live in Russia and are Russian citizens, but many of whom do not identify with the, the Russian uh, Federation's cruel and unjust war. Um, what about the ethnic Russians? Why do we want to write them out of, maybe everyone should be Russophone. Maybe we need to just throw out the term Russian. Um, but if that's what's going to happen, then maybe we need the, Rus the term Russian back. Why should we give it away? Um, I say all of this to you know, intentionally chase my tail a little bit. I think that we're at the beginning of a process which has been initiated. It was really initiated in 1991. I don't think that the world took notice or pursued it well enough in or outside of the Russian Federation. Um, and clearly 2014 was another warning shot that we should have taken much more seriously inside and outside of the Russian Federation. Um, but now I think we're face to face with this problem what to do with this culture, with this identity, um, or with these many identities and many voices. Do they fit together? Or are they uh, a constellation of different identities and voices which don't necessarily have to fit together? Um, and with that, I'd like to move to maybe the next question. Is there, a, is there a project of constructing alternative identities? Russophone literature of resistance. Is this something that needs to be built, how would one go about building it um, or not? Should there be different things built on the basis of Russian literature, past and present, Russophone, the past and present? How can it be built? What, what, what practical steps should be done in this direction, I, I would add? This might Who wants to begin this time? <laughs> This might also be a good question to start with for Maria, who has been an institution builder in the past. Yes, and continues doing that in the present. Well, Russophon resistance. Uh, you know, uh, in a way, uh, well, obviously I've been thinking about it for, for a year now, uh, from the moment when, um, when the first wave of immigration uh, had started after the full-scale invasion, uh, the, I, I mean, uh, the immigration from Russia. And uh, while I'm thinking of different ways and, uh, well, patterns for, well, collective and private resistance, I would say that maybe it is not the most important thing uh, just right now, for two reasons. Um, the first one is, uh, um, wow, well, not only for the last year, 
when this new iteration of the war had started. But for years and years, uh, since the beginning of the war, and even more since uh, 2012, or even since, uh, well, since the times when Putin came to power, the logic of the, the, of the relationship between the state and the individual was becoming more and more clear. Any human activity um, was slowly becoming a form of activism, which is which means that, uh, in a way, it doesn't have even to be conscious. You 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 are not necessarily you don't have to be an a political activist to provide some kind of a danger for this for this state. Uh, you could be just writing your stuff. Uh, trying to, 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 to write, well, to write it good. You can be just, you know, strolling through the street in Moscow or St. Petersburg, and uh, by some reason or without any reason, you're suddenly become, in, uh, becoming the enemy of the state. This state ha is a, a serious danger to the very concept of, well, any independent activity, private or collective. And uh, well, you have, we have to be aware of it, and uh, we have to be coping with this realization. But uh, there is another matter, and uh, uh, well, much more pressing. I think that uh, at this point, all our efforts and uh, all our thinking, and uh, well, our well, physical activism maybe should be devoted to another thing not to the consolidation of the Russian language or, well, Russian expats and those who are still staying. We need consolidation, but that's not the main issue. I think that the only thing that matters now is our help and support for Ukraine. And uh, that could be an only, well, point of or ground for consolidation that is really important because everything uh, on this well, fragile balance of, uh, of uh, good and evil in the, in the current situation. Everything is dependent uh, upon the, the outcome of this war and on Ukraine's victory. So I think that is something we should be building and we'll be able to talk about our own well, cultural climate and cultural legacies afterwards. Thank you, Masha. And we, we certainly agree with you in full agreement. I wonder if Ruthie, who also has been a, an institution builder, has a, uh, an answer to this question. The Kriolex Center is something that I've been fascinated with for many years. Thank um, you all. <laughs> based on um, a different kind of a logic of creating community or a community. <laughs> has your thinking about what that project means changed in light of what has happened um, uh, in Ukraine this past year? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, uh, my, my, my view or I don't know, my position here is quite, it might seem strange because uh, the institution that, uh, <laughs> the, uh, my institution is an imaginary one. And I think it's like an oxymoron or something like institution is something that, you know, uh, is, is something that, uh, and, and it's an authority that uh, decides what is real and what is not. And when we deal with imaginary institution, it's a kind of oxymoron because, uh, but uh, I think that in some, uh, in, there are situations when imaginary is the, the only like, um, the, on, the only um, uh, uh, possible way to, to do things. And uh, uh, we, uh, w w at some point, we started to call ourselves Cre Cre Creole people because we were just yeah, inspired by this theory of Creolization. And we were thinking, like, what, what, uh, how should we call ourselves if, if we are not, Kaz if Kazakh people do not. Uh, recognize us as Kazakh people, and then and 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 we are obviously not Russian. So it's like a, you know something, um, something in between. And uh, we just started to 
uh, make up uh, words for ourselves and make up uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, uh, identities, new identities. And uh, uh, um, the, so uh, I kind of believe in, 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 uh, in the power of imagination in, uh, that uh, obviously when you are... Uh, when uh, when you represent a community that doesn't really exist, you just uh, somehow um, addressing the future, and in a way, everything you do uh, is supposed to uh, to reach its audience s somewhere in the future. Maybe not now, but I mean, uh, now there are no Creole 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 people in in Central Asia, but maybe they will appear. And uh, uh, it's uh, the, 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 this is the reason why we uh, we always had uh, have had these discussions with um, those who think that we should uh, everything has to be based on facts on like objective reality and objectively since we are speaking this language we have to belong to Russian culture no matter what we think of ourselves, right? And, uh, but I think that um, uh, it also, I mean, I don't really believe that uh, uh, there is an objective situation or uh, uh, there is a, uh, there are like hard facts that we have to pay respect to in order to, uh, to um, define ourselves, so to say. I think that when it comes to uh, to the questions like who we are and we, what communities we belong to, it's more uh, our own um, choice and our own imagination plays a very important role. Um, so somehow, yeah. So, uh, the, the, yeah, so I, 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 have to, I have to add that uh, the, this, uh, the very term, term Russophone, uh, I think it, it, uh, it appeared very slowly. And uh, I remember uh, about five years ago, there was a huge discussion in Facebook. Uh, uh, Galina Rimbu wrote a post that uh, she has, like, uh, the post was about a rejection, certain rejection of the term Russian literature, and she was writing like uh, in the, in the Facebook like uh, I I don't like this Russian literature, and do, can't we just say Russia, Russian speaking or something? And there was a huge discussion under that post, and a lot of people were saying that uh, uh, the the only way of talking about ourselves is to use to use this word Russian. And uh, I, I think, um, and, and the term Russophone didn't even appear. I think I was just trying to uh, introduce uh, this term, but for me, it's really a salvation. I mean, it's really a, a good thing to, to think about all the non-Russian cultures, um, especially now when this, uh, kind of a rejection of the even of the term Russian of this definition uh, becomes more more pronounced. Thank you, Ruth, and and uh, I think that uh, the idea of creolization should 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 really get the speed in in Slavic studies. Uh, uh, Mikhail Shishkin, we were talking about institutions. Mikhail Shishkin has become a, a cultural institution himself from the writer. Uh, sort of uh, living a traditional uh, right uh, life of a hermit, producing uh, his novels in, into uh, the one who speaks for multi thousand rallies uh, all over Europe. So, 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 uh, Misha, uh, how would you answer this question about the consolidation of global Russophone literature? And to to to, to add spice to our conversation, uh, we we have a question in uh, the Q&A section. And uh, I, I, th I think it's addressed to you. It's, it's not my question, but I want you to answer it. Uh, what is the difference between when you say I am Russian culture and when Putin says it? Thank you. I think Masha 
touched just the crucial point. Yeah. The word Russian. Now it doesn't work because this word is covered with dirt and blood. That, that's the main problem. And we can uh, invent a lot amount of new definitions, but it will not help. Because a definition comes from mind, from reason, yeah? And uh, the word Russian is covered with this blood emotionally. What to do? We have already this uh, such a situation in history with the German language. And the situation with the German language was much worse. And for me, the example what to do, yeah, it is, of course, Thomas Mann. When he was a young writer, he learned by Russian writers. But now we Russian writers have to learn from him how to live, how to behave themselves in the situation of fascism. We know that he didn't want to give up. All the years in America, he uh, was fighting. He was fighting. He was fighting for German literature. He was fighting for German culture. He, he was fighting for German language. And he won. And this is the only thing we can do. We have to fight for our language being just ourselves. And no definition would help. Yeah, This will be just the same Russian language, but we have to make it different to clean it with what we do. I cannot give any advice to, to other writers. I can say what I do. I can do only what, what I can, writing and speaking. And uh, for me, it's very important, you see, uh, to explain to people here in the West what is happening in Russia and why. Because the politicians here, they don't understand anything in Russia. And they, of course, need these Russian experts. And we have seen in the last uh, 15, 10 years, how Russian experts help the politicians to bring the world to this catastrophe. I tried to do my best to organize here in uh, Switzerland the boycott of Olympic Games. I failed. Four years passed, 2018. This war, this Ukrainian war, yeah, has already had taken lives by thousands and thousands of people. Uh, soccer championship. World Circuit Championship in uh, Russia. Yeah, I tried to organize a boycott here again, and I was in the press and on TV, but who listens to writers? Yeah, All the nations came to play football in front of Putin. He accepted this, yeah, of course, in his own way. For And the way the door to this 24th of February last year was open. And still, I try to explain to people here in all my books and all my publications. And when Switzerland just gave up their neutrality one year ago and supported the sanctions, it was also my great <laughs> victory. It was my five copics, yeah, because after the years and years, it was my small victory. It was the only thing I could, could do for Ukraines to support their fighting against our enemy, uh, our uh, common enemy. And now I, my book uh, has been translated and actually in all, in all languages where I explain Russia, where I explain this war, uh, and where two last chapters are dedicated to the future. I write what will happen after that. And uh, I have a lot of e echo yeah? in Finland, for example. Yeah? This is uh, best seller number one on the list of nonfiction books because people uh, write me, oh, you explain to us what is happening. Thank you very much. So I think everyone must do what he can. Okay, thank you, Misha. 
Thank you so much. Does anyone uh, want, want, want to add something to this conversation? Ruthie, you, you want, want to say something, right? So let's, let's, let's then go on. Right. Been um, mentioned in several of our chats, um, uh, and I think also in parts of the issue, uh, besides the the example of Thomas Mann, there's also the example of Ceylon mm -hmm. uh, and other uh, German intellectuals, poets and authors. We can think also of Hannah Arendt, um, who were placed in a similar kind of a situation with regard to German language and culture uh, by World War II. But then once again, I think just echoing, am I frozen? Echoing what uh, several of our contributors have said here, um, Sorry, my connection seems to be unstable. Am I back? Echoing, I mean, fine. Okay. Yeah. Echoing what several of our contributors have said here. Um, the, the problem of writing in Russian, thinking in Russian, assimilating Russian tradition is really a problem for the future. Um, it's also a problem which you know, crosses between the world of the real and the imaginary uh, that Ruthie, uh, Mikhail, and, and Masha have pointed us to. Uh, as Masha said, in some sense, support for Ukraine and its war uh, is the decisive issue. But then also the decisive issue is what happens in Russia in the future. I don't think we could imagine the future of German literature and letters without the post-war uh, role that Germany has played and certain transformations in that society that have taken place over the course of the generations that have elapsed since that war. And it does seem to me that we are in a situation in which the, the question of Russian literature, identity, its meanings, the meaning of the word Russian uh, that, as Mikhail says, is right now um, um, denigrated um, and uh, emotionally and uh, in reality uh, drenched in bloodshed uh, is one for many years to come of the future. But um, let, me, let me turn our conversation in back to our to our uh, to our contributors and and the writers, and let me ask basically the same question, but on a more personal level. Of course, it's very difficult for a writer to uh, speak about oneself, but I'm I'm just curious, right? So, uh, aside from thematic concerns and politics, what else? distinguishes the kind of Russophone literature that, that you are creating from the Russian cultural mainstream. So what, 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 what would you say your personal, um, I don't know, note, your personal streak, your personal trajectory that you are developing? In, in a few words, if it's possible. Ruth, I think you already started doing this so maybe, maybe, maybe you 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 can begin here uh i really don't know what to say because, uh first of all i even don't identify as a writer i mean i just write occasionally <laughs> okay but maybe so I, I don't have this i, I think i think that the, the, mo the, the, the most important thing that comes to my mind uh, uh, in regard to your question is that um, uh, I uh, um, it's important for me to to think about Kazakhstani culture and Central Asian culture as um, of, as multilingual and also Russian speaking mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, it also, Kind of important to me to distinguish whatever we we uh, uh, what we do in Kazakhstan from 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 the Russian culture, not not to be a part of like somehow uh, uh, I try to contribute to Kazakhstani culture. If you know what mm -hmm. I mean, I mean it's uh, for me it's an, an important uh, uh, important part of my identity is my is the fact that my parents and myself were from uh, Kazakhstan and um, uh, but there is no such a, such a 
um, uh, um, such thing as Russophone uh, Kazakhstani uh, literature, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because most of most of our Russian speaking writers, they talk about themselves, they refer to themselves as Russian or Kazakhstani Russian. So mm -hmm. I don't know uh, 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 how do I distinguish from from the Russian main, mainstream culture. I never felt that it's it's I'm part of it. So so I don't know how to how to answer. Yes, distinguish right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you, uh, Marsha. How would you answer this question? Okay, I have to admit that I have, uh, well, serious problems with the question, uh, with the way how it is structured, because, well, first of all, um, well, uh, in the way you're asking it, uh, from the way you're asking it, I get this feeling that, uh, well, uh, there is some uh, mainstream, uh, presumably an evil one, and we are representing some group of, well, good Russians or whatever, who are, who have to be different from this mainstream because this mainstream is, well, for instance, a number of Zeta writers who are supporting the invasion, which is, uh, uh, well, uh, as, as you know, that would be a very simplistic picture, starting with the fact that uh practically none of the significant authors who've been writing in russian for the last 30 years uh with the one exception of uh well the harpy lepin who is not actually in good right a good writer at least in my terms no one of them is uh, supporting the invasion uh in explicit or even implicit way so i don't know what mainstream we are discussing and how we are going to define it. And uh, my own personal situation is defined by the fact that I am primarily and uh, mainly a poet, which takes me quite far away from, well, any possible mainstream. You know how it goes with poetry. The regular print round of a poetry book, well, comes from, well, one, well, 500 copies to, well, 3,000 if you're lucky. So we cannot be talking about any big numbers. Uh, but I have some uh, some answer that might be, uh, well, too general, but uh, still that's a point I would like to make. I don't think it is a good idea of giving the idea, uh, the, the, uh, of giving the, well, concept of, well, mainstream, so all the uh, 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 literature that has big audience, literature that can be influential, literature that can have consequences. I don't think that we well have to just label it as mainstream and us by definition uh, having something to do with the state and its, uh, and its crimes. And I don't think we should give up on the audiences even if my own work is not exactly, well, audience oriented. I think that, and it goes for the language as well, it would be, well, too easy thing to, well, just submit and to say that, uh, okay, we're building up our little island of, well, of uh, really good non-mainstream literature and uh, let them, well, move on with whatever they are doing. So, yeah, that's it, I guess. Thank you, Masha. But I, 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 I would slightly disagree. First of all, I don't think that, that there is only Zakhar Prilepin who is uh, supporting the war in Russia. I can, I can name more names, uh, uh, like Vadim Levintal, for example. If, Goodness. If you, if, uh, I mean, or, you, you would... Or, there are many other names that I can bring up. But speaking Levin, about... Mark, you... I'm sorry, but really... Uh, Vadim Levental is uh, a non-name. He's a prominent Petersburg literary figure. The uh, at, at a certain point he was perceived to be as one of the leaders, along with Viktor Toporov, of the uh, sort of um, national bestseller. 
circle of writers and 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 poets. So I I, I wouldn't uh, sort of scratch him out as as a non entity. He he is an entity, unfortunately. But but okay. So let's let's not go into personalities. What, what I'm saying that that um, with with a few exceptions that we know with the publication of Lukomnikov in Volga, right and uh, so, so very, very few other pointed publications. When we are reading uh, literary journals that continue to be published uh, in Russia, the, the impression from most of publications there is that nothing is happening, that everything is business as usual, right? Uh, and the, 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 the text that could have been written 20 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, are published sort of uh, there. That, that that's the mainstream. I, I, I'm not saying that the mainstream is is uh, necessarily uh, literature that that backs back backs this uh, ideology and uh, this horrible war. But uh, I would say that the mainstream is the literature that that pretends that this is not happening, right? Uh, and uh, th th there there is a certain certain gap here which which i think should be addressed and, and and i think that you you uh, as writers are directly addressing this gap because you are writing with with the war in your in your focus right even when as you said if you're writing about butterflies right so so that's that that, that is is my critical interpretation but, but i wanted to, to hear your 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 voice and your opinion uh, but if you disagree please uh, okay, I'll just add one thing. Um, uh, I'd say that the problem with what is getting visible, what is getting published in contemporary Russia, depends largely not on the, well, concrete persons with their writings, but on the very structure of publishing houses, the whole infrastructure that is yes. supposedly uh, caring and, uh, well, supporting the literary life. So the, the system of uh, literary prizes, the uh, literary magazines, uh, so-called uh, Tolstoy, the, 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 the big magazines and the smaller ones, <laughs> um, et cetera, uh, the publishing houses, uh, obviously, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, that's the situation where, where we have to define, well, there are, it gets trickier because mm -hmm. Uh, some of them are, while well, trying to define the level of compromise, they are able to, to allow themselves and uh, still to go on. But I would say that an average, uh, whatever it means, writer might be, well, uh, doing entire war poems and publishing them on Facebook. But a rare magazine would... Uh, uh, there to publish them. So I would be talking about structures that are actually the mm -hmm. heritage of the Soviet times and how these post-Soviet structures are, well, could provide an explanation for what is happening and what had made them so rigid and so, and still so important even 30 years after. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree with this, and maybe we'll return to the question of of, of alternative uh, venues and alternative, alternative publications, which which is being in the Q and A. So, so we've been asked about about the return to 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 some is that in the internet era, how uh, can it be facilitated? But I, I'd like to to readdress this question to to Misha. So, how how would you distinguish yes. yourself from yes. what is being published? In Russia, I, 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 I would say, I would say uh, carefully now. Masha has corrected me. So, what's what what, what what's your self definition? We are talking not about publishing somewhere in Russia. Actually, as a matter of fact, we are talking about the regaining of dignity for Russian literature, and to regain this dignity is impossible without two main conditions. The first condition is the defeat of Russian regime, the total uh, defeat. Yeah? And the second condition is a genius novel. Someone must write a genius novel about Russia, 
about how we came to this catastrophe, explaining why we are fascists, why Russia became a fascist country, why just uh, <laughs> defending the home country against Ukra Nazis, against NATO, how became Russian Russians became Nazis themselves. And no one now can write this novel. Not people who are in emigration, not me, not Masha, yeah, no, nobody can. And I think this uh, novel could be written by a young guy who is now at the war, at the war, uh, in the trenches. Maybe he doesn't know anything about himself that he is uh, that he is the writer. Maybe after, if he comes back home one day, you see, alive, yeah, and he will uh, have to answer the same questions: Что делать, кто виноват? Who is to blame, and what is to be done? And I hope this novel will be written, and this will return the dignity to us, to Russian literature. So, so why why do you think you, Masha, uh, already acting uh, writers uh, cannot uh, do this job? Why, why because do you it think will the, be the immediate will experience be, is necessary. It will be fake. It must be authentic. You see. All right. So we, we we can argue about this. It will take more time. Uh, I, I I am afraid. Uh, I I think that that that. Our conversation reached the point when when it should be resolved by by your readings because uh, we, we we sort of came to the point when when we all want to to express our opinions and you have already expressed them in 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 your masterful words so so I'd rather give the floor to to you Kevin what do you think Agreed I think it's time to actually turn to the readings we're going to uh, listen to all three of the authors that we have here today. Um, with and then readings. return to questions from the audience. We already have a number of questions, and so exactly. But we'll start with Mikhail Shushkin, um, and uh, Mikhail, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will read just a short part of this book in uh, English translation. It is my Russia. Uh, it's my explanation of Russia. Also, my declaration of love to this monstrous motherland. And that explanation of Russia through history and through personal history of my family. And if you understand Russia, you <clears throat> understand how it works. And so what will come after in the future. And so two last chapters are uh, dedicated to the future. And unfortunately, everything is goes. <laughs> everything is going after my script. So <clears throat> I remember reading a famous fable in primary school, in which an oak tree and a reed argue about who is stronger and more resilient. Every breath of wind moves you to and fro, says the oak dismissively. The reed doesn't reply. A little later, a violent storm draws in. The oak pushes against the storm and buckles, but the reed gives in to the gusts and survives unscathed. If you bend, you don't break. For us, they were nothing but words, but I now imagine that for our old teacher, they represented her personal experience of surviving in 20th century Russia. Western observers had long remarked on the Russians' fatalism and infinite forbearance, including the French diplomat Maurice Paleologue, who wrote, One of the moral characteristics I'm always noticing in the Russians is the readiness with which they accept defeat and the resigned way in which they bow before the blows of fortune. Often enough, they do not even wait for the decrees of fate to be pronounced, but submit and adapt themselves accordingly by anticipation, so to speak. 
the submissiveness with which Russians endure their pitiful condition and oppression by the state, and which seem to strange to so strange to Western travelers, is the key component of the Russian survival strategy. If you bend, you don't break. Fear is a wellspring of life, and it comes as naturally as breathing and eating. It is part of our instinct for self-preservation. Anyone who sacrifices themselves for their principles is trying to defy nature. For the majority, it doesn't matter under whose flag the next Mongol attack arrives. They will adapt to any dictatorship. If their ancestors had not adapted to Batu Khan or to People's Commissar Dzerzhinsky, they would have survived neither the Tatars nor the communists. I was named after my grandfather, Mikhail Shishkin, who was arrested in 1930 during the Soviet Union's collectivization. At the time, he was living with his wife and two sons, aged nine and four, and four-year-old would become my father, Pavel, in a village in the region of Tambov. The other peasants said nothing, but he protested. Why are you taking away our only cow? How am I meant to feed my two children? He was taken into custody and my grandma never saw Permisha again. He later died in a Siberian prison camp. In her final years, grandma started getting confused. She would say things that made no sense and lost her sense of time. Then her eyesight failed and she spent her final years living in a small room in the home of her son, my father, where she would sit in the dark for days on end. I called her whenever I could and would yell into the phone so that she could hear me better. Babushka, hi, it's me, Misha. Misha, she would ask, surprised. Who is this? Misha? She was probably reliving that day over and over, each time thinking and you that they were about to arrest her husband. She yelled into the phone, Misha, where are they taking you? Please don't let him go. What are you doing? I tried to interrupt her. Babushka, calm down. It's me, your Misha. But she wouldn't listen. She kept yelling, trying to get her Misha away from them, trying to save him. Let him go. What did we ever do to you? Let him go, Misha, Misha. Back then, the people who said nothing survived. That's how natural selection works in Russia. Russian history has shown that generation after generation, the state would eliminate or drive into exile anyone who didn't fit in with the system. The others learned the Russian art of survival. If you tried to raise your head, you would be decapitated. So it was better for your health to say nothing and lick the boots of those in power. This is how the policeman in Gogol's Dead Souls describes the interaction between the people and the state. The chief of police observed that there was no need to be afraid of mutiny, that there was a rural captain of police to see to it that it did not occur, and that even if the rural captain of police did not go there himself, but sent his cap, the sight of his cap alone would be sufficient to drive the peasants to their new places of residence. Like Gessler's hat in the legend of William Tell, the police captain's headgear symbolizes state authority. And the Russian peasants had, no, had more than enough reason to tremble before the captain's cap, just as the captain himself knew exactly why he trembled before the major's cap. And on it goes, up the social ladder, until trembling, you got to the monomarch's cap. 
the actual physical person plays no role all that trembling. It is the superior rank itself that instills fear. And those at the very top in turn tremble before those who tremble before them. The source of Russian state power of war and of all law is violence, pure and simple. The state can do what it wants with us. The people are at the mercy of an occupying power. As Nadezhda Mandelstam, the widow of the murdered poet Osip Mandelstam, once described it. It's as if we were living on a sated ogre's kitchen shelf. The state is your destiny. Mere mortals cannot influence the system in the same way that you can't choose your destiny. That is why the state is sacred and why the Tsar, who symbolizes the state, is a sacred figure. In Anna Karenina, Levin asks a peasant, have you heard about the war, Mikhailovich? What do you think now? Ought we to fight for the Christians? Why should we bother our heads? Alexander Nikolaevich, our emperor, has thought about it for us, as he always does. He knows best. Why should we bother our heads? You aren't supposed to think, be it about war or whether they will tarmac your street. What you are supposed to do is submit and do as you are told. Everyone knows that showing initiative is undesirable and that everything, good or bad, comes from above. And so on. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I think that, that Ruthie is next in our program, right? Yes, we were I going to have Ruthie think... next. Okay. Then I will read the my little poem that is published in this issue, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to read it in uh, Russian. And then, uh, Kevin, would you read the, the, the translation or shall I? Uh, however you like, Ruthie. I'd be happy to read maybe, the translation. Maybe. Okay, then maybe I'll ask you to read the translation. Okay, very good. It is called um, blood cell from, I mean, it's called Kravitvarenie, uh, which is uh, a word that is similar to the word Stichatvarenie somehow. <laughs> and it's about Nauris, uh, the, uh, you know, the Eastern holiday. В международный праздник Наурыз найди меня стоящий не у роз, не среди искр фонтанчиков и брызг, среди фантомчиков и розг. Сыграй мне полонез, а может блюз, используй рот, язык и шанхобез. Любили падать вверх, теперь боюсь, любить придется падать вниз. Случится рецидив, как в прошлый раз, полночных излияний, энурез и кровотворный зуд, как псориаз и озноб, гифоз и гемопоэз. И мы встретимся, казах Жане Орес, чтобы друг друга довести до слез. Татарка написала бы наврыз, а терапевт Thank you, Ruthie. Um, I'm so happy to be able to read this uh, translation uh, that was um, completed by Elaine Wilson. Uh, Elaine is a writer and translator and language instructor and a PhD candidate in Mark's department at Columbia University. Um, <clears throat> On the, so it's titled, as we said, Blood Cell Formation. On the international day of Nauriz, look for me not among the roses, 
nor among the sparks of fountain mist, but among specters, briar, and rushes. Play me some blues, or maybe a polonaise. Play the shankabuiz. Use your mouth and tongue. We loved to fall up, but now I'm afraid in order to love, one must fall down. There will be a relapse as in the past, midnight effusions and erasis. Blood formation burns like psoriasis, chills, scoliosis, hematopoiesis. And we will meet. Kazakh Janya Aris, to put one another through sorrow and bliss. A Tatar would have said, Noris, but a therapist, Neurosis. Thank you, Kagan. Thank you. I did my so best. Um, are you going to read one more, Ruthie, or is that it? Um, actually, I was uh, going to read one more, but I'm not sure if um but i would like to to read this uh, little text uh, that is called three bifurcation and four variants if i may sure. and i will i will go on with russian right and uh do we have the uh, translation in our in our database Oh, I can. Oh, I can. Uh, maybe I can read it because it's like a, a little prose. I can read it in, in in English. In English, maybe. Yeah, all right. That, that would be great. That, that, that. With without Russian, right? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, great. If, if it's cool. a longer text, right? Yeah, because I think it it looks it it looks it looks somehow uh, better in uh, in English. Uh, I think. Um. <laughs> so, uh, three bifurcations and four variants, a parable. There was a man who, due to an unfortunate incident, lost his hand and grieved at length in solitude. His sorrow passed in time, and he made the firm decision to forget his complaints and learn to enjoy life anew. Here, the story splits into two lines. Line A. And so he went to the people and said, Look, I may be one-handed, but I am still fully valid and equal to any of you. I want you to acknowledge this. Here, line A splits into two variants. Variant 1. The people answered, don't be stupid. Why deny the facts? You cannot do what two-handed people do. You are, f you are not fully valid, not like us. Acknowledge this and go live on your own. Variant 2. The people answered, You are right. Your unique circumstances do not make you inferior. You can do what two-handed people do. You are fully valid just like us, so come and live together with us. Line B. And so he built a big house and sowed a garden around it. Soon enough, the people came to him and said, look, we may be two-handed, but we are still equal to you, and we want you to acknowledge this. Here, the story divides into... Uh, it divides into two a third time. Variant three. The man answered, don't be stupid. I've gone through a difficult ordeal and paid dearly for an experience that cannot take place among the two-handed. You cannot understand me. You are not like me. Acknowledge this and go live on your own. Variant four. The man answered, Though you have enjoyed the carefree life of the two-handed while I endured my trial, you are now finally able to understand me nonetheless. For you are just like me, 
So stay and live together with me. The end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now I'm giving the floor to Maria Stepanova. And uh, Masha, will you begin from poems uh, with poems uh, published in the issue or? Let's uh, let, let's start with them, right? Uh, and uh, maybe I'll need to say a few words. Uh, um, these two poems belong to a, well, a small book or maybe a group of poems I've been writing since the uh, the full scale invasion had started, and uh, well, I didn't yet come to terms with these poems as well as well as with the whole situation which means that uh, uh, for me, this book is still a sort of a work in progress. So I didn't yet publish it. And uh, I still don't know what to think about the status of these uh, poems. Is it, uh, well, uh, could it really work as uh, a well, thing of poetry? so to say, or is it just a, well, a number of lines written from the position of a witness, because now I think that we all are, well, somehow reduced to, to, to this position, uh, especially because there is seemingly not much we can actually do. So witnessing still seems important. Um, so these two poems uh, that belong to the sequence, uh, uh, which Russian title is Bez Uyka, uh, like Bez uh, Yezika, uh, in a, like a non-gwage, uh, or without a gwage uh, language that is getting, well, devoid of a good half of the word. Um, so, yeah, and uh, here are the poems, the first one. Глубоя, и в нем флаг, не видно какой. Живые люди два, гоняют мячик, живой. В поварском переднике, обтянувшем живот, держит белую сигарету на выходе из кафе. У женщины очки на живом носу. Живые собаки натягивают поводки, летние рубашки, легкие пиджаки, как положено у живых, топорщатся на ветру. Ничто не выдает места, где это все происходит. Тут никто не лежит в воду лицом, никто не демонстрирует такой необъяснимый, нарушающий все приличия отказ встать и, по... и встать и ожить и дальше пойти по земле живых. Даже мяч, смотри, и тот не лежит, а скачет. И второе. And the second one. Yeah. Written in summer 2022. Пока мы спали, мы бомбили Харьков. Потом, чуть позже, чайник со свистком и дачные стволы стволели солнцем, и створки лета отворял обзание и слезы, и заря, заря, и Харьков черным дымом исходил. Пока мы ели, мы бомбили львов, потом входили за старшими в наморщенную воду, в дыму шашлычном лязгали старикозы, Потом запели хором мы про то, как берег покрылся сотнями постреленных людей. Так шло, заваливаясь, будто утка, в июле утро. And, uh, um, and, uh, a few other poems uh, belonging to the book uh, The War of the Beasts and Animals that was written seven, well, already eight years ago in the summer 2015, when the, when, when the poem was actually, uh, when, the, when the war was already raging for, for a year. 
Этой ночью над полем военных действий Нахтигаль, говорит с Нахтигалью, соловея от непонимания. На соседних пространствах птица-птица из уст в уста передает, как лягушку, точное знание. Земляная цезура между зрячим и зрячим пятном, между крапчатой зоной огней, подогретых соседством жизни и ответным свечением. Между ними слепоты древесного мха, перелеты томительные, бронетехника, линзы, наводящиеся на движение. 22 июня. Ровно в 4 часа я ничего не стану слушать, я закрою все свои глаза, и я зарою вражьи голоса, и не включу программу «Время». И если кто придет, то я не в теме. Я птичка, я нейтральная полоса. Те, кто держит во рту, сперва осторожно, головы с глазами. Те, кто трогал в уме газету, как мама учила не никогда и руки отмой. Те, кто рвут на лету, переносят из дома в дом, размазывают по стеклам, Тупорылое тело пробуют установить на колеса и катить, выставляя жерло, поплевывая в направлении те и эти, но в большей степени эти для них самобранку новобранцы раскидывают зеленые руки и им ложатся в ноги тупыми березовыми стволами, чтобы понравиться карне. По желанию жили, по велению баяна, по побудке у аккордеона и о голоса детей, поющих, где было купол, в нечистом поле, в окружении хлебов и пугал. Не на земле она а телепот, глухая война идет. Она смазной источает пот и трогает за живот, И мы шарахаемся, себя в темноте неся. И мать Диметра выходит мять ногами тугу полей, И сверху слышится вашу мать, а снизу кажется чуть белей. И мать Геката наперекор выходит из тупика, от черных улиц, от черных кур, из луж разбитого молока. Земля лежит земляным мешком невзятого языка, и мать Мария бежит пешком, но нет ее здесь пока. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And all these were translations by uh, Sasha Dagdale. Uh, no, no, not all of them. The first two were translated by. Uh, the first two by by Ansley Morse. So those, 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 Thank you, Masha. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Dear colleagues, we, we don't have too much time and we have uh, many questions. So so I suggest the following uh, work of, sort of uh, order of the following work. Um, one of you will pick the question and answer it. Uh, sort of, uh, and others uh, are very welcome to, 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 to join, to add, to, to, to correct, to disagree. But uh, we, we are not expecting that everyone uh, present will be answering the same question. So, so let's. I think this will 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 speed up. Okay, does it make sense? So uh, th there is a group of questions uh, from um, Tanya Vakard and from Yusef Hanfar um, about about how to relate the the contemporary situation to the languages from the Soviet past with its um, parallel existence of uh, official, non-official and semi-official literature. Uh, and uh, the experience of some is that Olga Zilberburg also adds so much of Soviet literature was literature of resistance. I'm thinking of Lydia Chukovska, Wunderstein Grossman and so many other. Uh, do we have things to learn still from them and their work? So, so I, I think we can group these questions into into one, and uh, how the, uh, the the contemporary situation is different from the Soviet situation, and what 
uh, we still can learn from from the Soviet experience of of resistance, of course, of resistance. We could add to that even the pre-Soviet uh, experience. I mean, it's uh, the question is, is there a, a history of anti-imperial resistance in Russian literature? Uh, what is it and how can we learn from it now? Who would like to begin to take this question upon oneself? Masha is literary critic. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, okay, so, so that's how you pass a... the ball. All right, okay. Um, no, um, I'm fine. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not really being a literary cricket, uh, critic, but maybe I'll start now. Uh, why, why, why not? Or I could be criticizing, well, something else uh, myself for, 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 to, to, to start with. I think that, uh, yes, of course, uh, there is this huge tradition of independent thinking, which could be, well, anti-state, anti-system, uh, anti anti-empire. -em and uh, it is a long-standing tradition that didn't start with the Soviet regime, but is, well, it, it had started, well, maybe with the name of Radishev, the, the, the end of the 18th century, or maybe even with the medieval Russian literature, because there is, for instance, a beautiful uh, a beautiful work uh, that is called, the title is Malenia's Daniela Zatochnika, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is written straight from the prison. Um, uh, and uh, the 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 anonymous uh, the non anonymous author is trying to discuss and define his um, relationship with uh, with the power, and uh, so on and so forth, uh, including Prada uh, Tovavakum and uh, a number of other people. Uh, but I'd say that there is a serious difference uh, with what we used to have. And uh, with the current situation, because um, in the previous times, uh, staying, staying, or well, standing in this position of a solitary person or a small group of people that are opposing this enormous, uh, devastating power by the state, you could still well help yourself or warm yourself with a feeling that if the worst happens you are the you are a victim the victim uh, so a certain a certain form of innocence was preserved in in terms of self perception that allowed a person to feel uh if not righteous, then just right. But this war is not only well being done in the name of all the Russians, including us. We also were the, the political generation, a few political generations that actually could try to do something to, to defend our country, our language, our culture. Uh, uh, against the forces that came to power in 1999 and still feel so cozy. And uh, it seems that whatever we've been doing, uh, writing, thinking, uh, protesting, it was, obviously it was not enough. And so we have to, to understand uh, where are we standing right now? Who are we? What 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 community do we belong to? And uh, we know that whatever we will, wherever we will go with our own definitions, we will be defined from the outside. There is this external viewpoint that also means a lot, and there is the point where these two views well coincide or clash one against each other. So I'd say that's the difference. But still, of course, reading, acknowledging, and even using the writings of the Soviet time, the resistance writing, as uh, 
even as a guidebook, it is, well, endlessly important because, well, still it's good to know that someone had been there before. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Ruthie, Misha, do, do you want to add anything to this? Or you, you would like to, to jump on? Yes, Misha, go ahead. No, I just cannot add anything optimistic. You see, uh, I think literature also is always loser concerning the fighting the regime yeah, or fighting against the war. Yeah? Russian great literature couldn't stop Gulag. It helped to survive in Gulag. All my books, all books by Masha, by all our friends, yeah, which were published in the last 20, 30 years, they could not stop, they could not prevent this catastrophe. And the Soviet Union uh, collapsed not because of the <laughs> literary of dissidents. Yeah? And now, now, of course, literature can do nothing just uh, the weapons decide, yeah? Just the uh, tanks uh, will, will help us, yeah? To, <clears throat> to, to, to gain the, the victory in this war. And uh, anyway, the majority of population who supports this war, they, they don't read books. They will never read my books, or they will <laughs> never read my, my Marsha's books. So uh, j just we will try to survive in this situation, Yeah, like my Marsha's wonderful poems. They help people who read uh, these poems on internet, on Facebook, to survive somewhere in Siberia, or in Israel or in the United States, but good, good literature really uh, may make any influence on the on the future of, of Russia now, on the future of this regime. I think we always overestimate the influence of what we do. Um, I. I probably will disagree with this uh, radical statement because, of course, uh, we, we overestimate uh, the, the importance of what we do. That, that That's why we do what we do. Uh, but uh, on, on the other hand, indeed, we, uh, we we didn't prevent this catastrophe, but but at least we can uh, work on toward, towards uh, making it impossible in the future, toward, towards changes in, in the culture, because uh, at least I believe that that uh, everything that happens in politics and uh, in um, in history in general is coming uh, from from culture and from cultural uh, sort of habits and cultural processes. And so, so the the, the battles that that uh, happening now in Ukraine had been lost by by by, by us. Uh, way way before on on the pages of, of different books and and it's not that important that not many have have read about that and uh, Misha your, your your favorite Thomas Mann never never uh, became the the writer for millions but but still his influence is detectable ne neither this happened with with Ceylon right but uh, uh, we're returning to this so so I, I think that 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 what we are talking about is the um the need the the urgent need to to make or uh, launch some processes of of change uh, self critique self analysis in russian culture that were not going on and, and where they will lead that's that's not of course entirely in our control but we, we can do as misha as you said we can do what we what we can do right uh let, let, let me go back to, to the questions. Uh, uh, our joint dear friend, Professor Anna Skatnitska from, uh, from Krakow asks, uh, does it mean that we uh, uh, will be able to access Russian literature only in English now? Uh, and I will continue this, this sarcastic question with, with a continuation. Is there a need in the uh, Russian language, Russophone publications from the abroad, is there a need in a new edition of uh, Tamizdat in the new uh, version of Argus? How do you look at this at this problem? I know how Marshall looks, but but if you reiterate your position, I would, I would be very happy to hear that. 
Ruthie, what do you think? You, you are doing, uh, uh, you are feeling comfortable in, in, in English, but do you think that we need a Russophone publication? Publications? Uh, yeah, for sure we do. Uh, because, uh, um, I, I would just repeat myself and say that uh, Russian language doesn't belong only to, you know, to the Russian state. So, uh, and I personally would be interested, interested in uh, uh, like uh, uh, claiming a Russian language and Lush, uh, 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 and Russophone culture as part of uh, other countries' mm -hmm. cultures, like as part of Kazakhstani or, uh, mm -hmm. culture, for instance. And uh, I think that maybe uh, now it's uh it, it becomes even more urgent in a way because uh um i don't know uh it's uh the of course uh, russian language is an imperial one and it is perceived uh, now as a as a language of uh aggressors or like a, a, a language of an of empire but as you know, we know from the history, the the uh, imperial languages often become uh, uh, like uh, mm, uh, become languages of resistance. They 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 uh, uh, they become uh, re um, uh, how is it called? Like the yeah, the, I mean, realization is also part of this uh, of this. Uh, mm, uh, um, uh, reclaim, uh, reclaiming, sort so to say, of imperial culture by by colonies, by former colonies, also. Exactly. And I think it's a very important, you know, process when we when we take something from the empire and make 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 uh, and uh, those values and also uh, cultural values become. Uh, instead of being a tool of oppression, they become a you know a mean of resistance somehow. This yeah. answers in uh, some sense one of the other questions, which is in the chat about the yeah. possibilities for using uh, <clears throat> the imperial Russian language as a as a language of anti-imperial resistance. I'm glad that you addressed that. I just wanted to come back to some of the things that. Uh, uh, Misha said, and also to Masha's earlier comments, you know, the most important thing is, as she pointed out, is to support Ukraine, which was in some sense a response to this question, do we need to build other kinds of platforms? Um, you know, it, Misha's point that the Russian culture has lost um, so far, perhaps that's true. Um, but I, I would still say the, you know, part of the peculiarity of Russian literature over the years over the ages is that in a consistently autocratic system in which the state dominates the means of literary and cultural production, uh, the fight to create a civil society, to create other platforms for expression is also a fight to create a different kind of a political system, a, a political system in which other voices can be heard, voices that the state doesn't want to be heard, uh, alternative communities, communities of the non-Russians or of the colonized can be heard. And uh, just pointing back to what some of our questioners have said, which I agree with fully, and I think Mark agrees with me as well, the history of Samizdat um, and Tamizdat, uh, the underground writing in the late Soviet Union, was a noble attempt to create alternative platforms of public life, alternative publics, to make them visible. Um, the, it's very difficult, I think, to disconnect the problem of building platforms, building communities, building readerships from the problem of rebuilding some other Russian political space following this awful catastrophe, uh, which has many roots in culture, but also many roots in the organization of Russian political life, um, which is to this day extraordinarily centralized, imperial, as we know, and autocratic. Um, so sure, we've lost so far, but I think that that doesn't, um, allow one to separate out culture and say culture can't win. Uh, culture is all we have <clears throat> in some sense, and it has to win eventually. We, we, we haven't addressed many 
uh, comments uh, in in the chat and uh, our participants uh, uh, i'm sure are reading it many many and i'm very grateful to those who contributed to it uh, named or anonymous and uh, your comments are extremely valuable and uh, i i'm sure that we will return to them in the future but uh, our time is up and uh, we have to to wrap wrap it up and i want to uh thank uh first of all all who were with us this this more than 90 minutes this 100 minutes let's say right uh and those of you who who followed the discussion who contributed uh, to it and of course uh many thanks to the hariman institute who hosted this 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 event and many th thanks to, to uh world research today and of course our our authors our contributors it's always pleasure to see and hear you and uh, uh, once again it was it was great to be with you in this virtual space thank you thank you dear colleagues thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank, thank you, you very so much. much and also to the to the romanov center we should say as well and the romanov center of course how could i forget oh. indeed thank, thank you, you all so much bye-bye bye-bye now bye. Bye.